Hi, this is Martin Harris. Listen to Fascination Street Podcast. Will you say it in German? Yes, Martin Harris. And uh, that's his uh, Fascination Street Podcast. Do it in Russian. It's a Martin Harris. This is uh, the uh, Fascination Street Podcast. I believe that everybody has a story. And I'm fascinated to hear them. So come with me as we take a walk down Fascination Street. Welcome back, Streetwalkers. This episode is with Dakin Campbell. Dakin Campbell is the chief finance correspondent for Business Insider. He previously worked 10 years with Bloomberg covering finance and banking until he got poached by Business Insider to cover a very specific IPO mishap meltdown thing. And he's been with them ever since. In this episode, we talk about his early years working at the Baseball Hall of Fame. What? We talk about his little detour between getting his college degree at Cornell and then getting his master's degree at Columbia, some of the things he did in that gap. And then we talk about why he decided to specifically focus on finance and banking. We do cover the East Coast versus West Coast finance philosophy. That's a pretty interesting conversation. You're going to dig it. And then we talk about his new book, Going Public, How Silicon Valley Rebels Loosened Wall Street's Grip on the IPO and Sparked a Revolution. We talked about why he felt the need to write this book, what he hopes the reader gets out of it, and what he learned from the research that went into making this book. Dakin is a super fascinating guy. He has a lot to say about finance, banking, and IPOs. And if he's talking about those things, I'm going to listen. This is a knowledgeable dude. This is my conversation with chief finance correspondent and now author, Dakin Campbell. Welcome to Fascination Street Podcast, Dakin Campbell. How are you doing today, man? Doing great. Dakin is an unusual name. I only know of one other Dakin. Do you know who that is? I don't. His name is Dakin Matthew, and he's a Broadway actor, and he's also been on a whole bunch of things that are on TV and film. Sure. I know his name, certainly. I've never met him. Oh, he was in a play on Broadway, and my wife and I sat in the front row, and I was just staring at him the whole time. Because I'm like, I know that guy. Where do I know that guy from? Where do I know that guy from? And I guess he caught me staring at him. And then he just kept looking at me like, what? Why is this guy staring at me? (laughs) Somebody told me that means I'm not supposed to be in the front row anymore. Yeah, right. Exactly. I don't know how to act. And uh, I'm going to have to agree with them. Dakin, where were you born and raised, man? I was born and raised in uh, upstate New York. Grew up in a town called Cherry Valley. Went to high school in Cooperstown, New York. So home of the Baseball Hall of Fame, which is how everybody knows it. Wait a minute. The Baseball Hall of Fame. Didn't you work there? I did work there. Yeah, in high school. Okay. What'd you do there? (laughs) I worked in the stock room, stock in the gift shop and doing a bunch of intake. I mean, not terribly exciting stuff, but it did sort of put me in the Hall of Fame. And so I got to meet a bunch of Hall of Famers when there were events and when they passed through. So that was cool. Who was your favorite person that you met? Oh, Hall of Fame wise there. Oh, that's a good question. Bob Feller is one that I remember. You know, I think around that time I read his autobiography and uh, I remember him being a, a good guy and a gentleman. But there were many over the years. I'm glad he left a good impression. You could have said something like, oh, I met Pete Rose and he punched me in the kidneys. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. He's not even allowed in that building. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> So, Dakin, what did you want to be when you grew up, man? What was the plan? There really was no plan. I mean, I went to college, I guess, pre-med, so sort of hardcore science. Well, there was a plan if you were pre-med. <laughs> yes, although I didn't really execute it very well. So by the time I was done, I knew I didn't want to be a doctor or a lab technician or researcher. And so, you know, spent a few years trying to figure out what what I wanted to do and spent some time teaching abroad teaching English abroad, taught in uh, in the inner city of Boston, restored old farmhouses as a carpenter, did some cabinetry. Confused much? <laughs> <laughs> and then made, finally made my way to journalism. 
you went to pre-med or whatever, but you have a degree in... A human development. What the hell is that? That's uh, like child development, sort of half psychology, more soft science, and then half more hard science like biology, chemistry, physics, things like that. And that's from Cornell, right? That's right. But then you got a master's from Columbia in... In journalism. Oh, finally. Yes. <laughs> so uh, was there a gap in between your Cornell and Columbia? There was, yeah. So I went to Columbia when I was 30, graduated Cornell when I was you know, 22 or whatever. And so all those things I listed in the beginning filled up that gap. I went back home to Cooperstown for a time and one of my friends from high school was running the local community weekly and said, hey, you know, we've got an opening for an assistant editor. Do you want to join us? And so that was really my start in journalism. And I did that for a couple of years and then moved down to New York to go to Columbia. Got you. It was a long road, but interesting. It sounds like it was a very fascinating road with all the crazy stuff you did. <laughs> Why journalism? Good question. It was not something that was necessarily on top of my mind when I was in high school or certainly not college. You know, growing up, I had books around me and magazines. And when I graduated college, I realized that I was pretty good at talking to people and I liked writing my thoughts down on paper. And so when I was wrapping up that journey or thinking about the next thing to do, I sort of came back to journalism and realized that, you know, I really liked talking to people and I liked asking them questions and I liked writing it down. Hey, me too, but I don't write it down. <laughs> what was your master's thesis on? Very good question. I guess it was a final project, and it was about a storefront church in Brooklyn. I was very interested in sort of evangelical religions at that time. And so uh, I went walking into Brooklyn at one point and went looking for a church. And I found a storefront church, but I was the only person in the congregation on that first day. And so I sat in the audience for like a four-hour sermon in this storefront church in, in Brooklyn and thought, I, f I just found my story. And so I got to know that there was a congregation. They just weren't there that day. Got to know them and got to know the priestess and really sort of explored. That ended up being a Pentecostal church where they spoke in tongues or claimed to speak in tongues. And so uh, I spent a bunch of months with them and and sort of learning about the religion and writing about it. You spent months developing your thesis paper thing? Yeah. I mean, the Columbia program is a year. And so, you know, first in the fall, you try to come up with a topic. And then from January to May, you report it and write it. Got you. How'd that go over? I think it went over fine. I found it very interesting. In the end, I think the people who were sort of in charge of the church found me to be a little too skeptical. You know, I was asking by the end pretty hard questions that I'm not sure they wanted to answer. And so, you know, we didn't end up on great terms at the end of it, but it was interesting. And I think I did well on it and my professors enjoyed it. And it was a good, it was a good story, I think. I'm going to agree with them on your skepticism because minutes ago you said it was a Pentecostal church and they spoke in tongues or they claim to speak in tongues. <laughs> <laughs> your skepticism is still with you, my friend. Yes, it is. This is true. Do you think that uh, skepticism is an integral part of journalism? I do. I do. I mean, I think our job as journalists is to ask hard questions and to, you know, really sort of drive to get at the heart of an issue. And so uh, I do think skepticism is is an integral skill. It's a slippery slope between skepticism to cynicism. And so I think cynicism is doesn't have a great place in journalism, or I would like it to have less of a place. But skepticism, I think, is very healthy. I agree. Please take this in the spirit in which it is intended, which is uh, all in uh, the pursuit of the truth. No. Do you think that the perception of journalism has taken a hit in the last few years? I guess my truthful answer is I don't spend a ton of time thinking about it. Most of the journalism I do is business journalism uh, or financial journalism. And so from the seat that I'm sitting in, 
I don't think that has changed a lot in the 15 years that I've been doing this, or certainly not in the last few years. Financial journalists had had their reckoning uh, around the financial crisis and and what they covered and what they were writing about as the bubble, you know, inflated and then popped. But I think political journalism, which is maybe what you might have in mind asking about with your question, is not something that I really spend a ton of time thinking about or interrogating. And so, you know, I guess the short answer is not really, though I guess I've read maybe some of the things you've read or or heard people talking about it, but I haven't examined it. I think I could not have possibly gotten a better answer. So... I feel like it's safe to say whenever some random fool says journalism is dead, true journalism is dead. I think like everything else, we can just say some, maybe, but not all. That used to be the catchphrase of everything we used to say. You know, it was always, well, some people, some companies, some whatever, but not all. So I I love that. I love that you don't spend any time thinking about that. I think it's fantastic. And I, I agree that it has not touched your field of late. Are there any finance scandals in recent history that you wish you could have been doing your job at that time? Does that make sense, that question? Yes. I mean, I think any good journalist, I'm going to answer this one way and you'll tell me if this is the this is the answer you wanted to hear or the answer to the question you're asking. I think any good journalist, when they see a scandal that has been covered or potentially exposed by other journalists, thinks to him or herself, hey, I could have done that or I wish I'd been in the middle of that because that's a great story and good for my peers in the industry for bringing that to the public's attention. And so, you know, on any given day, there are stories or there are scandals that have come about that I think to myself, like, if I was in the right place at the right time, that I could have been there with them. But the place I come down is really, I'm glad somebody was there to cover that behavior or to bring that to the public's attention. It's very magnanimous. And I don't mean that in in a sarcastic way. You know, a lot of people would have said, yeah, I would have crushed Enron or whatever. But you were just like, well, I mean, if I would have been there, I would have done some stuff, but I'm glad somebody did. So I think that's a great answer. And yes, that was what I was looking for. It's a competitive industry, right? Certainly business journalism is, but I guess most journalism is. You know, if you let yourself be consumed by the scoops that you didn't get, then you end up spending a lot of time on things that you can't control. And so I like to sort of focus on the scoops I can get and the companies and the people that I'm writing about that are in front of me and just make sure that I ask the hard, tough questions of of sort of what's in front of me and try to try to set the noise aside. Is there a difference between a journalist and an investigative journalist? That's a great question. I guess there is. You know, I would argue that more people, more journalists should consider themselves to be investigative journalism or journalists. I think the act of reporting is an investigation, no matter how deep you go. So I think if more journalists were to consider themselves investigative journalists, they might ask more questions or do more public records requests or look for that one more source. And I think the more of that we can have, the better off we are as a society. Oh, snap. So you <laughs> you worked for, I don't know, roughly 10 years with Bloomberg covering finance and banking down in San Francisco. Is that right? I spent 10 years at Bloomberg. Six of those were in New York, and then four of those were in San Francisco. Got you. So given that you in your 30s, decided journalism was what you wanted to do. Why the specific call or draw to finance and banking? Yeah, that's a great question. I was at Columbia in 2006, or I graduated in 2006. And so that was right at this moment in time when, uh, it's a long time ago now, but- Oh you my know, God, the, that um, means you're younger than me. <laughs> Holy shit, I just did all that math. And I'm like, uh, wait a minute, this guy has done all of that and he's younger than me. Oh, I like you a lot less now, man. Oh, man. That's right. Hey, that was some quick uh, math calculation in your head. I'm impressed. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> 
And so really the financial crisis was the story of the day and the story of of the years when I was coming of age as a journalist. And so that was a really exciting time to be covering banking and to be really thinking about finance and writing about finance. And so that was very formative as I sort of came out of Columbia and, and thought about what type of journalism I wanted to do. During those years, I was working in banking. Ah, <laughs> I was a mortgage loan underwriter for okay. a savings and loan that eventually got bought and then they got bought. And then now Wells Fargo owns all of those people that they bought. Wow. I also worked for USA for a little bit, but the very first one was called World Savings and Loan. And if you were anywhere around San Francisco, I'm sure you saw World Savings and Loans everywhere. Here in San Antonio, I think there was one branch, but they had a big headquarters here. Okay. Because I guess we're cheaper than California. You're not, but. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. I think it was within my first three months of ever being in any banking or finance at all ever, because I came from restaurants. I came home and I told my wife, I don't know how this is sustainable. It doesn't make any sense. Because at the time, World Savings, and they say they invented this loan. I have no idea. But remember, these are for mortgages. There was a loan called No Income, No Assets. So we would give you a loan to buy a house, and we didn't ask you to prove how much money you made or how much money you had. That's wild. <laughs> well, the ensuing collapse is the result. And so I remember telling my wife, and she brings it up all the time, um, she words it a little bit differently because she's a sweetheart. She says, I predicted it. Mm. But I was so confused, especially I grew up kind of poor and it was really hard to get that first car loan. It was really hard to get a decent credit score. It was really hard to get my first apartment. And then to, you know, fast forward, whatever, 10, 15 years, and we're giving half a million dollars to somebody, we're not even asking them how much money they make or how much money they have. It just seemed really weird. And it turned out that a lot of it was um, foreign nationals. Hmm. Anyway, it was a whole shit show. So I was in banking and finance. Well, if you want to call mortgage lending that at the time that I guess you were being inspired by the collapse right. of our financial <laughs> system. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess you're welcome. I, I don't. <laughs> right. And I guess I should say that, you know, being inspired by the collapse really got me excited about my career. But I recognize a lot of people, you know, went through a lot of pain as a result of that. And so, you know, I've really thought about really my job being to hold the banks accountable and lenders and, and investment banks and things like that. So I don't want to be too flippant about how you know, the crash was a great time for me or something. No, no, no. I, I wouldn't. I I hope that was not how it came off. I, I just think that it's really cool that those events inspired you to help make sure that that might not happen again. Yeah, exactly. Or that, you know, the people are a little more informed so they can make better decisions or whatever. I, that's where I was going with it. Yep. I think that's super cool. How long did you last at World Savings? Well, I lasted until they got bought by Wachovia. And then I was there until they got bought by Wells Fargo. Okay. And the really funny thing about all of that is that I was allowed to work at Wells Fargo, but I wasn't allowed to bank there. And that's because 10 years earlier, I had a bank account at a bank that they bought. And I was, I guess, blacklisted from that bank. And so they carried that over. And so even to this day, and it's, wow. been, it's been 30 years and I'm not wow. allowed to, I can't, I can't have a Wells Fargo bank account because wow. I, I made somebody mad at a bank that they bought 30 years ago. That is so weird. That is, that's wild. So when I was in San Francisco, I was writing about Wells Fargo. <laughs> I moved there in 2009 to write about Wells Fargo and I covered them as a beat through 2013. So you moved there specifically to write about them. Yeah, that's right. I mean, they're headquartered in San Francisco. And when I was with Bloomberg, before the crisis, nobody was writing about Wells Fargo. There was no beat reporter. And then all of a sudden, Wells Fargo bought Wachovia and became this much bigger bank. And Bloomberg said, hey, we need to have a beat reporter out in San Francisco to cover Wells Fargo as a beat. I was working in New York and they brought me out to do that. Is that common 
to have a reporter specifically dedicated to an institution or a couple of institutions? That's very common. Yeah, certainly in business journalism, most of my career, certainly at Bloomberg, was devoted to covering several institutions as a beat. And so it was my job to know everything that was going on inside them. I guess that makes sense. I had a tech journalist on named Trip Mickle. Do you know him? Yeah, Trip and I went to Columbia together. Get out of town. Yeah, he's a good guy. He's a super cool dude. Listeners, you might remember, I don't know if he still is, but he was dedicated to writing specifically about Apple. And then he he also wrote a book. Is that a common thing? You guys, you're laser focused on a specific area or whatever, and then you get so knowledgeable that you just write a book about it? I think so. I mean, that is not exactly what happened with my book, but I think it's pretty common that if you write about a beat for a long time, or you're looking as a jour- as a beat journalist to take the next step, writing a book is that step. I can't believe you know Trip. That is so weird. Yeah. That is bizarre. I mean, cool, but weird. What a small world. It's great. Hey, Streetwalkers. Here's a word from our sponsors. Let's get back into it. So then... Uh, This might be the wrong word, but after 10 years of Bloomberg, you got, I'm going to say poached, by Business Insider to cover the WeWork scandal or debacle or whatever you want to call it. Is that accurate? Yeah, pretty much. So at Bloomberg, I had transitioned from writing about Wells Fargo to writing about Goldman Sachs, again, as a beat. And so Business Insider hired me to continue covering Goldman Sachs for them. They had just started this paywall, which we now have. And I was one of the sort of first people to come over and write behind the paywall for them about Goldman Sachs. What does that mean? Like subscriptions. Okay, gotcha. So a year later, WeWork was going for its IPO. And because I'd spent that time in San Francisco learning about the tech industry, even though I was ostensibly covering Wells Fargo, they asked me, my bosses asked me to pitch in on covering the WeWork fiasco. And so I wrote a big sort of feature story uh, narrative in September of that year, September 2019. And it got a million hits or something like that, which was a lot at the time. And it led an agent to reach out to me and say, hey, really, I really like this story. Would you be interested in writing a book about WeWork? They said, hey, I really like these numbers. Yeah. Can't you write a book? (laughs) And my answer to him was, no, I don't want to write about WeWork. That's not super interesting to me. Yeah, I I said everything I had to say. I don't have a book in me about these fools. Right, exactly. Although several other people did, you know, friends of mine who've written great books about WeWork. But I said, you know, one of the things that is more interesting to me is the IPO process that WeWork failed so miserably at or you know, that sort of didn't serve WeWork in the best way that it could have. And so going back to my financial crisis roots and interest, I saw the IPO market as as a system, a, a part of the financial markets that I could dive into and really understand and and sort of come back up and explain to readers in a an easy to understand language. And so that was my answer to the agent. And it took us a while to put a proposal together for a different book, for the book that I wrote, but then we were off and running. So in a nutshell, if you can, like as fast as you can, can you explain what was the issue with WeWork? Why did it receive such national attention? What what happened? What's the story? Sure. Because a lot of the people who listen to my show have absolutely no idea what we're talking about. Sure. So WeWork is a company that basically leases office space, dresses it up, makes it look nice, and then subleases it out by the room or by the desk. And they were really trying to tell or paint a story to investors that they were a tech company, when in reality, they're really a real estate company. And so in a nutshell, that's what happened to the IPO. They tried to get a tech valuation, which are much higher than real estate companies. And all the investors, once they got a look at their financials, said, no, actually, you're a real estate company. We think you should be valued much lower. And everything sort of collapsed from there. 
you know, I think we work at a founder, this guy, Adam Newman, who is very colorful and over the top. And so a lot of books and podcasts and TV series have focused on him. But I think at its core, WeWork really was trying to tell a story about being a tech company and the growth rate of a tech company, when in reality, it was a real estate company with the growth rate of a real estate company. A real estate company with no assets because they're just leasing everything. That's right. Interesting. That sounds like a very interesting business model. <laughs> I'm going to borrow something and I'm going to rent it to you. I don't own anything ever, but I'm going to make a couple of ducats on the end. Right. And they were leasing the office space on 15-year leases, if I remember correctly, and then turning around and subleasing it on you know month to month in some cases or a year lease. So they would have people end their subleases with WeWork and then but then WeWork is still putting money out the door to the actual owner of the property even if the space isn't filled. Sounds like a legit business. <laughs> <laughs> Real quick, I just want to say that now you're the chief finance correspondent for Business Insider, is that right? That's right. Okay, I just want to get that out there. Is there a difference between East Coast and West Coast finance philosophy? Hmm. I think there is. And that's part of the story that I try to, that's part of the argument I try to make in my book. You mean that book that's called Going Public, How Silicon Valley Rebels Loosened Wall Street's Grip on the IPO and Sparked a Revolution? That book? Yes, that one. Exactly. Oh, okay, cool. Available <laughs> where? Oh, everywhere? Oh, okay, go ahead. <laughs> So, I mean, I think your listeners know that Wall Street has been sort of the center of the financial industry for centuries. And with that has come an entire culture and a, a set of practices for how they go about doing business. Silicon Valley out in California has really only been around since really the 1960s. I didn't even know it was that long. Yeah, that's when it started. And but I think it really took hold in the 80s and 90s. And, you know, they're doing things differently out there. They're really looking to come up with world beating, world breaking technologies. And the finance people out on the West Coast are really largely venture capitalists. And so they're investing in these private companies and hoping to make successful bets on, on the ones that grow and define new industries. And that's very different than New York, which for centuries has been focused on stock and bond markets and institutional investors like mutual funds and things like that. And so there is a clash between the venture capitalists and the startup executives who want to do things fast and they want to build these fast growing businesses really quickly and the investment bankers and the institutional investors and, and mutual funds who are excited about that growth, but also you know, want there to be some prudence to it. Do you think that on the one side, the philosophy is more of a, I want to make money grow, and then the other side is, that's cool, but I also want to make humanity better? I think for a long time, that's one way to put the dichotomy. You know, I think the growth of the social media companies and others has really challenged the idea of, you know, these companies that we're building, these apps that we're developing are making the world a better place. I mean, you're that telling me, hold on, you're telling me <laughs> that the Twitter trolls are not an added benefit. Okay, I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> So, I, you know, I don't explore this much in my book, but I do think there is a reckoning or a re-rating of that idea that, you know, Silicon Valley folks are sort of out to make the world better. There are some notable people from that community who are challenging that very notion. Well, let's talk about it. Let's talk about your book, Streetwalkers. The book is called Going Public, How Silicon Valley Rebels Loosened Wall Street's Grip on the IPO and Sparked a Revolution. I asked Trip Mickle this same question. Now I'm going to ask you, when did books start having an entire paragraph as the title? Good question. I'm sure Tripp answered this more succinctly than I will, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't get more succinct than that. <laughs> That's hilarious. So was that your idea or was that a publishing idea to just make 
37 words the title no i think that's a publishing idea you know with the title being two or three words and then the subtitle or the tagline i've heard it described as both painting a little bit of a narrative or a story got you i think trip's book is also two words with then some long sentence after it that is correct. It's two words and then, uh, I don't know, a dozen words. So, right. yeah, I don't know what is going on. <laughs> but I do know that back in the day, like, to kill a mockingbird, to kill a, that's it. That's all we got. That's right. Just, that's it. I know that most of the biggest songs in history, they have three or fewer words in the title. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but... Not with books. At least that's not the way it's going. So while we're talking about the book, let's actually talk about the book. What is this book about? What was your goal in writing this book? Why did you write this book? So I wrote this book because I really wanted to understand the IPO market. For your listeners, let me just put it as simply as I can. You know, the stock market is made up of shares of companies that people can buy and sell. And that share of a company gives you a slice of that company's profit and assets. And an IPO is really the first time that people like you and me and your listeners can get access to those shares. So an IPO is initial public offering, but it's really the first time that the public can get to own stock in a company. And that's really important because for companies that need money to grow their business, to go into new markets, to hire coders or salespeople, they need more money. And so they go to the public markets, to you and I, to raise that money. The way that they go about doing that is the IPO, and it's this process that hasn't changed in 40 or 50 years. I really wanted to understand what that process was and why it hasn't changed and understand what the few companies that had been able to change the process, how they were able to do that and what they were able to accomplish. Most people, when they want to learn more about something, they read a book. How is it better to write one? As a journalist, my job is to ask people lots of questions. And so I do read books, but I also ask a lot of questions. And what I find is that I don't know something as well as I need to until I sit down and start writing about it. I think a lot of people realize that they think better or more clearly when they force themselves to sit down and write it. And so writing a book is the discipline of going out into the world, learning a bunch of stuff, and then coming back and proving to yourself that you learned it by writing it down on paper. Wow. It's deep, huh? <laughs> I've never, ever heard it put quite that way, but yeah, that's deep, man. Well done. I'm going to go out and not write a book about anything. Holy moly. That is fantastic. When did the book come out? At the end of July. Oh, of this just past July. Of this past July. Yep. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. So it's out it's selling well and a lot of people are getting a lot of good feedback on it and you know one thing that's made it hard is there hasn't been a tech ipo this year and we're in the longest drought since 2002 after the dot com crash so ipos are not on the tip of everybody's tongue or you know at the top of the news cycle but they're a very cyclical thing so they will be again and i'm already hearing talk about a lot of companies that are going to go public early next year Okay. I'm glad you brought that up. You wrote a book about a thing that hasn't happened in a quite some time, <laughs> but that is going to happen very soon. Why not hold it until those things start to happen again? Why release it during this drought? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Some of it is the publishing calendar. Okay. And some of it is, I think, even though we're not seeing anything happening, there are a lot of conversations taking place. I've heard from a lot of people who are thinking about doing an IPO and are thinking about going to market next year. And so reading my book at the time that they're thinking about it and preparing for it, it actually makes a lot of sense and is a time when it can be most useful for them, actually. That's genius. I'm so glad I asked that question. I'm going to ask another question that you're not going to answer. <laughs> Who are those companies that are about to do IPOs next year? I'll, I'll write them down. Yes, right. Exactly. <laughs> uh, 
There are a couple who have declared their intention to go public sometime soon publicly and reporting, not mine, but others, you know, Reddit, the community discussion board is thinking about going public, Instacart, the grocery delivery company is another one, and there are a bunch of others too. What is your personal opinion on giant businesses taking over other businesses? Earlier, we talked about Wells Fargo buying Wachovia, who had previously bought World Savings. And then recently in the news, I saw that I think Kroger is buying Albertsons or the other way around. I don't remember which. Is it Kroger buying Albertsons? I don't know. But what do you think about these massive, massive companies? I mean, this is like a, almost a $50 billion, that grocery store transaction. What do you Do you have a, an opinion about massive companies buying other massive companies? As a journalist, I try to take each transaction on its own, you know, but I will say that you really uh, are a journalist. As a consumer, you know, I think smaller companies are more dynamic. And so when I see two big companies getting even bigger, I don't think that's a great thing. If we look at any industry and see two or three or four companies that are dominating that industry, I think it's hard to argue that that's a perfectly competitive industry or that consumers are getting served as best as they can be. And then I think there's a lot of theory that holds that to be true. And you know, obviously the Biden administration is taking a new approach on antitrust. And I think the people in the administration think in somewhat similar terms. With that in mind, I agree. I don't, I, I don't, I personally don't like it. Uh, n- not as a journalist. I don't like it as a consumer <laughs> when big companies buy other big companies. But on the practical side, like let's take Wells Fargo, for example, Bloomberg didn't have a dedicated reporter to focus on Wells Fargo until they became so big that they needed one. I have no idea how many dedicated reporters there are to grocery store chains, but if there wasn't one for Albertsons and there wasn't one for Kroger, there's definitely going to be one now for whatever company they end up being. And so I guess that's a good thing because now somebody's going to be paying attention. Think about all of the stuff that Wells Fargo got in trouble for a couple of years ago. If they weren't so big, nobody might have noticed for a long time, right? Yeah, I like that theory. That's uh, I think that's a, a positive take on it. I appreciate it trying to spend gold here man i'm trying to i'm trying to turn all this straw into some positive theory this is going to be a tough question and it's okay if you don't answer it how confident are you in the business practices of wall street and silicon valley that they're all above board and legit mm. uh i will tell you that i don't know any specifics but that i spend my days and my weeks and my years looking for and talking to people about companies that are not above board. I don't want to talk about any anything that I'm working on now. Absolutely. But, I would I don't want that at all. <laughs> yeah. But I think that's our job as journalists is to be shining a light into dark corners. And sometimes when we shine that light, we'll find that everything is above board and and that's great. And sometimes we'll shine that light and we'll find that not everything is going according to plan or not everything is, you know, legal or or above board. And and hopefully writing about it brings that to the attention of the authorities or consumers or or other readers. You just described the job of a restaurant health inspector. <laughs> they walk in they're not they're just trying to make sure everything's kosher if if everything's cool they move on their merry way if not they're going to have some questions that's right i guess the big difference is you don't get to eat for free they usually give grades on their way out the door right we don't do that uh, no uh, no you don't <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember when you were in kindergarten and you uh, you didn't get number grades? You got letter grades like N, S, U. That's right. That's what you do. They give number (laughs) grades and you give satisfactory, unsatisfactory, needs improvement. That's what you do. (laughs) (laughs) The book is called Going Public, How Silicon Valley Rebels Loosened Wall Street's Grip on the IPO and Sparked a Revolution. Do you mention specific Silicon Valley rebels? And kind of, I don't know how they loosened them. It'd be stupid if he didn't. (laughs) Yeah. So the book really goes into the first part of it is the history of the IPO market, because I felt like that was important to sort of set the stage. 
the rest of the book is the specific stories of the companies and the people who have brought about change. And really the pioneer was this guy named Barry McCarthy, the former CFO at Netflix. And he was the CFO at Spotify, the big music. Barry's been on the show before. Has he? No. Go ahead. <laughs> he is also now the CEO of Peloton. Oh, oh my God. I hate that guy. Oh, no. Please continue. So I think the person you're really angry at is the founder, who's John Foley. Barry McCarthy has come in after the fact to try to right the ship. What's his name? John Foley? Yes. Hey, John Foley, meet me at three o'clock by the bicycle racks after school. It's on. Okay. <laughs> But back to the book. So Barry McCarthy, when he was at Spotify, really set out to figure out how he could get his shares trading publicly, how he could get them into the hands of people like you and me, but without using the investment banks and without selling new shares. Typically, the way an IPO works is a company issues new shares to raise more money. And Spotify didn't need more money, but he did want the shares to be trading publicly so that investors and employees could sell if they wanted to. And so he set out on a, I guess, 18 month journey to figure out if there was a way that he could just directly list Spotify shares onto the exchange. And in April of 2018, he was able to do that after getting approval from securities regulators and working with his lawyers to sort of create a new way of doing things. And so I tell the Spotify story and I describe Barry McCarthy and sort of what kind of a character he is that would allow him to sort of change this process that had been set in stone for, for decades. It sounds like the good kind of McCarthyism. <laughs> so this guy's name is Barry McCarthy. When did he leave Spotify? I think he left Spotify in 2020. Is he the guy who's handed out tens of millions of dollars to podcasters? Yes, they Spotify did get into. No, I know Spotify did, but is he the guy who, I guess, led that fight? He was there when they did that, yes. Uh, yep. Barry, buddy, pal, <laughs> I know you know some people back there. Pick up the phone. Uh, holler at a fella. <laughs> Rogan doesn't live too far away from me, and um, I, I'm poor. <laughs> yeah, he's doing pretty well. He's He's doing okay, I guess. He's doing all right. I expect to read about that and Fascination Street in, what, a year or two? Maybe in a month after this episode airs? The day after this episode airs, you're going to be writing a book about how you did it. <laughs> and just so you know, Barry McCarthy and all of his friends, I'm way cheaper. <laughs> Jake and Campbell, as we're headed out, is there anything I didn't ask you or we didn't talk about that you wanted to talk about today? Did I miss anything specifically? No, I don't think so. I mean, we talked about the industry. We talked about the book. We talked about how I got into it. We talked about your time at World Savings. I mean, we covered a lot of ground. <laughs> we did. We definitely did. But we, what we didn't talk about was your next book, How I Impacted the Baseball Hall of Fame <laughs> in Cooperstown. That's right. <laughs> That'll be a memoir. There you go. Oh, I can't wait. Once again, folks, the book is called Going Public, How Silicon Valley Rebels Loosened Wall Street's Grip on the IPO and Sparked a Revolution. Man, that is a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to read this book. I'm very excited. I'm more excited now than I was when I read the whole paragraph title the first time. Good. I'm glad to hear it. Even the second time. And I hope your readers are too. Well, my listeners will be. My readers, they don't. My yes, readers are, um, exactly. But now that I know what the book is about more specifically, I'm a, I'm a lot more excited to read it. I know that sounds weird, but just like Tripp's book, I hate Apple. I hate everything about Apple. I, I've never purchased an Apple product for myself. Oh, wow. I am an outlier. I'm the only person in my family who doesn't do that. I'm the only person I know who's not an Apple fan, but his book was phenomenal. Mm. love them or hate them, and by them, I mean Apple, he did a great job on that book. And so regardless of my opinions on IPOs or <laughs> Barry McCarthy or John, what's his name? John Foley? That's right. Regardless of my opinions on these people, I think that your book is going to be super, super fascinating, man. I can't wait to read it. Yeah, thanks very much. This is 100% my pleasure. Dakin, tell everybody where they can find you on social media. 
Yeah. So I'm on Twitter at Dakin Campbell and that's D-A-K-I-N Campbell. DakinCampbell.com is my website. You can buy the book and read reviews and learn more about me there too. Instagram? I'm not on Instagram for business. How about TikTok? You do a bunch of dancing on TikTok? (laughs) I haven't gotten there yet. So arguably, the only social media you're on is the worst one? And LinkedIn. (laughs) That's that's not real. When I ask people for their social media tags, if they try to tell me they're LinkedIn, I just stop them. I'm, I don't. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Go follow Dakin Campbell at Dakin Campbell. Go check out his stuff at DakinCampbell.com. And once again, go grab that book. <sighs> Going Public, How Silicon Valley Rebels Loosen Wall Street's Grip on the IPO and Sparked a Revolution. I can't thank you enough, Dakin. You have been a gem and a treasure. Oh, maybe you're a gem that is a treasure. Maybe you're a gem that's inside of a treasure. You're Pirate's Booty. You are Pirate's Booty. <laughs> Dakin, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy day and your hectic book writing and IPO researching schedule to hang out and let us get to know you a little bit better on Fascination Street. Man, I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks a lot, Steve. This was fun. 100% my pleasure. And I think that's it, man. Sounds good. You have a great rest of your day. Yeah, you too. Thanks, Dakin. Take it easy, buddy. Take care, man. Bye-bye. Bye. Oh, and tell Trip I said, hey. I will. <laughs> I'm going to text him right now. He's going to be like, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye, buddy. See ya. Opening music is the song Magnolia from the 2001 album Intransigence, used with permission from Douglas Miles Clark. Closing music is from the song Say My Name off the 2021 album Underdog Anthems used with permission from Jax Hollow. If you like the show, tell a friend. Subscribe and rate and review the show on iTunes and wherever else you download podcasts. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. All the episodes are available there as well. Check me out on Vero at Fascination Street Pod and TikTok at Fascination Street Pod. And again, thanks for listening.